delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega Swast, India. It's our pleasure to present now the Fortune Men, Nadifa Muhammad in conversation with Nandini Nair. Writer Nadifa Muhammad's book, The Fortune Men, shortlisted for the Booker Prize 2021, is an unsettling account of post-colonial prejudice, injustice, and the fight for dignity based on the real events surrounding the imprisonment and execution of a Somali man in Cardiff in the 1950s, her vivid narrative style humanizes the accused's aspirations and vulnerabilities. The book observes the process of her slowly fading belief in the British justice system that is subsequently replaced by spiritual contemplation and urgency. Brutal and equally compassionate, the compelling novel shines an essential light on a neglected period of British history. In conversation with author Nandini Nair, Muhammad explores the nuances of bringing this haunting tale to life and gives us a glimpse into her writing process. Nadifa Muhammad is the author of Black Mamba Boy, The Orchard of Lost Souls, and most recently, The Fortune Men, which is shortlisted for the 2021 Booker Prize. She's the recipient of both the Betty Trask Award and the Somerset Mom Award, among others. Mohammed was named one of Granta's best of young British novelists in 2030 and is a regular contributor to The Guardian and the BBC. Nandini Nair is a literary and cultural editor of Open Magazine. She's worked as a writer and commissioning editor in the feature sections of the Indian Express and the Hindu. Nair predominantly writes on social and cultural issues. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, the Fortune Men, Nadifa Muhammad in conversation with Nandini Nair. Thank you, JLF, for having me here. It's my pleasure to be with Nadifa Muhammad, uh, the writer of the wonderful book Fortune Men that was shortlisted for the booker. Um, and I will confess that I was sad that it did not win. Um, but of course, I think that's just the way of life and the way of fate. Um, and in many ways, this book is about fate. Uh, for those of you who have not read it, uh, I urge you to, but just to sort of give a very uh, simple summary of it. Um, it's the extra, it's the story of an ordinary man with an extraordinary fate. Um, I think that's what Nadifa called it in one of her essays. And I think that kind of sums up the story as well. Um, it reimagines the real life story of a Somali seaman who was wrongfully executed for a murder in Wales. But I think it's much more than that. Um, it's of course, this is the story of a miscarriage of justice. Um, I think miscarriage is in fact too a uh, lighter word because it implies accidental and this was definitely not accidental it was more it was a deliberate uh, I would say uh, a murder of justice in fact um, it's also the story of being a black man at that time uh, in the 50s in Wales and what that meant and what that experience was um, it's also the story it's a love story uh, between a black man and a white woman uh, they belong to different races they belong to different religions and what uh, horrible circumstances uh, involve and how they kind of get stronger through those circumstances in a way. Uh, for me personally, what I also really enjoyed about this book was the relationship between the two sisters. Uh, there's Diana and there's Violet. Violet is the sister who is murdered um, and Diana is her sister and her young daughter, Grace, and how they sort of grapple with this horrible tragedy of their sister being murdered in an adjacent room while they are sort of tap dancing and having dinner in the room next door. Uh, so there's so much in this beautiful novel. Uh, of course, the fact that it's based on a true story, I think is especially uh, poignant, but it's a book of extraordinary compassion, I would say. And thank you, Nadifa, for being here with us. And thank you for writing uh, this great book. Um, so I'm just going to sort of start off uh, with the background of the book to kind of tell readers a little bit about it. Um, you have mentioned how your father, a sailor, knew uh, Mohammed himself. And could you tell us a little bit about what were the early stories you heard about him and your journey from finding out about him to, of course, writing the novel at the end, writing the book at the end? Sure. Thank you, Landini. So, yes, my father did know him, but that's not how I found out about Mahmoud Matan. I read about him in the Daily Mail, a horrible British newspaper tabloid, 
which had done a double page spread on what had happened after Mahmoud's conviction was quashed in the late 90s. So I saw a photo of him in the, in the newspaper, <clears throat> sorry, and wondered what was the backstory to all of this? Why him? Why then? Why was he even in the UK at that time? And I didn't realize that my father had been in the UK at that time. They'd arrived in 1947 separately, but following slightly, slightly similar uh, journeys where they'd left Somalia or British Somaliland as it was then um, as very young boys and had found their way across the world really until they'd got to um, Britain. So I found him intriguing and my father had known him when they both lived in Hull um, in probably 1949, 1950. But my father just kind of considered him one of the men, you know, one of the sailors that he had known nothing specific about him at all. And it was only when I started researching in earnest in 2015 that I realized that Mahmoud wasn't ordinary. He was quite an outsider um, amongst the Somalis, amongst the Muslims. Um, he'd stopped going to sea, he had married a local woman and taken up gambling in a heavy way. He was someone who didn't mind going against the rules. And I think that's one of the main reasons why the police were able to isolate him and pin this crime on him. Um, what, can you tell us a little bit about the process of reimagining a true story like this? So, of course, there's a lot of research that's gone. And I think you also mentioned somewhere uh, the strange documents that you came across during your research. Uh, one that you mentioned is the autobiography of a sailor, Abraham Ismail, um, and what that revealed to you. Um, and then mm. how, wh where does the research end and where does imagination begin? Ah, I'm not sure. Um, so the autobiography of a Somali sailor by Is Ibrahim Ismail, um, or Ismail Ibrahim, I can't remember which way around now. Um, that was, I, I found that when I was researching my first novel, Black Mamba Boy, about my father, who was also a Somali sailor who'd had this crazy early life. So these were very, um, I think the, the way that that region was hit by colonialism and the way that that interacted with a nomadic culture meant that these young men, and particularly it was men, not women, um, really didn't know where they were going, but didn't care where they were going. So they had these very incredible lives. So Mahmoud Matan, he walked and traveled from Somaliland all the way down to South Africa, picking up languages, picking up friends, picking up experiences. And then he joined the Merchant Navy from South Africa. My father went from Aden to Somaliland, to Eritrea, to Sudan, to Egypt, to Palestine, to back to Egypt, and then to the UK. So this is part of my own kind of family backstory. And I think a lot of those sorts of stories you just imbibe, you imbibe a certain sense of humor, a certain way of looking at the world, philosophy. My father always called himself a citizen of the world. So in one aspect, I understood Mahmoud before I even started researching him. But then in another part, when I got to the archives and read his police interviews, his court transcripts, the meetings he had with the prison doctor, you see a 25, 25 uh, 24, 25 year old man thinking that he has the capability to tackle this system, this huge state, this imperial state as it was still then um with a false confidence and you see the way that they're just working in this very cold way to take his life <laughs> and that was probably where the tension emerged where i'm on his side for sure but i'm also shouting at him saying don't say that don't do that you wake up wake up realize the danger you're in um but of course you can't because this is so distant in the past uh, since you mentioned that, I think one of the, the tragedies of this book is how he believes in the British justice system. Like even till the very end, he's just like, this can't be happening. Uh, I am an innocent man. Uh, I am going to be able, the system is going to real, recognize that. Um, so what was it like, like, as you mentioned about how you were trying to grab him from those jaws of misconception? Yes. Yeah. And it's not just belief in the British state. I think he was also it's a belief in natural justice, divine justice. He became more religious, it seems, in prison. And you think that God, Allah, will, will save you. You know, you're putting all your hopes on that. 
and psychologically maybe that's what kept him together is that just, he just could not believe the fact that they could do this um, and he'd had you know small interactions small but regular interactions with the judicial system in the UK and they had been okay with him you know he had generally been found innocent um, he had been found guilty um, of stealing arms from the mosque in Cardiff in Tiger Bay um, and I think he probably was guilty so you know he, he had been treated pretty fairly in the past and in this case you know this was a huge crime this was murder um, and he had nothing to do with it and he knew that he had nothing to do with it so how on earth could the same justice system find him guilty? Um, you mentioned previously about how um, your father thought of himself uh, as a citizen of the world, a global citizen. Uh, Mahmoud also um, has, of course, moved from uh, Somalia to the UK and maybe in some way thought he was a natty guy, right? He dressed well. Uh, like he says, he grew up listening to poetry. It's not like he had a, a, a terrible childhood and he, he owns yeah. that. Uh, uh, but yeah. do you think that we kind of, uh, today at an age and stage where we realize the idea of a global citizen cannot exist, even though at one point we might have liked to have thought that. Yes, and there's two types of global citizens. I think there is still the kind like my father who are doing it out of complete poverty and don't ex don't respect rules because they don't know the rules. And, you know, they, they hustle for work here, they, they hitchhike or walk wherever they can. And I think those people do exist still, and you know they're entering Europe still. But are they are they allowed to then settle, make a life, um, change themselves in any meaningful way? As you know, as we're seeing now with Ukraine and all of this, you know, they're not refugees; they're international students who are paying for an education in Ukraine, and who are now being treated as second, third class um, people. That there is there is something about coming from these formerly colonized countries that means you're never a full citizen of anywhere, even if sometimes your own countries. So I, I think my father lived in a particular moment, you know, he grew up, um, he came of age just after the Second World War where, you know, countries were becoming independent and there was all of this enthusiasm for a new kind of world. And I think we're not there anymore. I think now the cold, calculations of how much each human life is worth according to where they're from and how much money they have, how much status they have. I think we can't help but see that now. Um, it's interesting when you mention uh, how much status they have, it just kind of takes me to a line uh, where I think Mahmoud feels that his wife is suddenly becoming conscious of the various markers of status um, and how mm. you know he wants his children to grow up you know, maybe following Islam, but she's kind of taking those steps back during their separation. Um, could we just yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Sure. So a lot of the British women, Welsh, English, whatever they might have been, women who married foreign sailors, they were often very young, very rebellious. Sometimes they were women who had um, already kind of lost, lost a lot of social status in British life for various reasons. So some of them converted to Islam and completely adapted themselves to their husband's culture and way of life. And Tiger Bay was somewhere where you could do that. Um, but then others, I think, wanted to keep a leg, in, a foot in both camps um, and have a mixed race relationship, a mixed religion relationship, but also have respect in the eyes of their family and white community. And in, the, in those cases, the way that the the community that he had married into was perceived by the British community, white community, was important. So, you know, Somalis were seen as troublemakers for various reasons, often for not good reasons, you know. Um, the British were still following this very colonial taxonomy of how their, how their natives behaved and thought and lived and what, how they did things. So that was imported back into the UK, um, along with the colonial officials and the colonial subjects themselves. So, you know, how much money these immigrant communities had um, if their children could pass, that was a huge thing, you know, and that's something that the, the, the men had no control over. If your children looked Indian or Somali or Nigerian, then that's that, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. While if they looked, if they were half Maltese or half Yemeni and could pass as Welsh, that, that gave them a, a massive uh, 
head start in life. So Laura wanting to have Welsh names, you know, have the, have the children be Christian. In a way, it's also for survival. It's a way of trying to make life a little bit easier for them. But in the end, it didn't work. You know, the fact that they were mixed race, had a different surname, um, a Somali surname, all of these things, as well as just the way that they looked, hindered them in life. Um, you've written somewhere how you've always thought of yourself as Somali living in Britain. Um, is, is that something that's changing over time or do you think that's how it is? <laughs> I don't know. I think it changes all the time. And I think it's not a good time to feel British or to want to feel British, to be honest at the moment. I think the government that we've had, what we have and that we've had for a while now, is not conducive to a feeling of a shared country, a shared past, a shared future. It's very crude and, and cruel. The way that um, Muslims are treated, the way that black people are spoken about, the way that new refugees, immigrants are talked about is really frightening. And I don't think it's been as bad as this in my time in the UK. I think it's got much worse. It's now as if I think the mask has been taken off, any pretense has been taken off. And what's, what makes it maybe even nastier is the fact that it's often um, expressed from people from immigrant backgrounds, you know, people in government from immigrant backgrounds who are willing to co-sign the most nasty right-wing policies. Right. Um, which sort of brings me to the next question, because I think while reading this book, um, of course, it's set in the 50s in UK, uh, but it could unfortunately tell us of today's times as well uh, about what it means to be a black man in a public space um, and about how the police might treat him and about the yeah. sort of racial um the institutionalized racial biases that the police might have. Um, and you have this line where you describe Mahmoud um, as a human silhouette in motion and how he is called the ghost and he's always trying to make himself invisible. Um, so yeah, could we talk a little bit about that? Sure, I think that there is something to be said and people have written about it for a long time. You know, uh, Richard Wright who wrote Invisible Man mm -hmm. and it's a mixture of being invisible but also being hyper visible. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a space, when, when you, for me as well, you know, I don't think it's just men, it's women as well. If you're in a shop, if you're in a hotel, if you're in a new country, that feeling of being hyper visible is very strong. But then you are also invisible in ways that matter. So um, what you think or, you know, your perspective is often not seen. Um, you're, you're spoken about rather than to, all of these elements, I don't think they've got any better. Mm. Certain things, you know, are not the case where, you know, that blatant discrimination that you would have faced in the 40s and 50s when looking for a job or looking for an apartment, uh, house somewhere, um, it can't be expressed that boldly anymore. But that discrimination in, in, in effect is not much better. It's just, it's just more subtly worked around. No, I mean, like back in India, um, being a Muslim, being a Muslim woman, it's very tough to find a house. I mean, it's just it's one of those realities that persists, uh, however much we want it and wish it away. Right. It's, it is there. Um, yeah. it, it's interesting how I think in this book uh, there are various languages used. Um, and of course, for an Indian reader, I think there are many Hindi words that come up. And I was just like, oh, I know this. Um, and uh, so could you talk a little bit about sort of creating the lexicon of this book? Because I think if I'm right, there's Somali, there's Arabic, there's Hindi, there's Swahili, and of course, there's English. Oh. Yeah, and a bit of Yiddish, a bit of Welsh. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to have as much of that as possible. I One of the challenges I set myself in this novel was to... Um, really tackle the way that language and vernacular reflected the way that people lived and also impacted the way that they lived. Because when you read the court transcripts and the police interviews, they have Mahmoud speaking in this broken English. And I don't know how much of that is true and how much of it is like the way that the police think <laughs> these men speak. But I know that Mahmoud was multilingual. He spoke five languages. Um, and he lived in this multilingual, multi-ethnic world where you would get by, you know, 
someone, lots of people could not speak English in that environment. And I have the guy, and it's true, I think from the actual records, the, the man, the Indian character, the, the poker house guy, um, Villa Khan. Mubasha, Villa, Villa, is it Villa Khan or Mubasha? I think Villa Khan is the one who runs the poker house, right? Villa Khan, yeah. <laughs> um, he, in real life, the, the man that he's based on didn't speak English, didn't want mm. to speak English. So Mahmoud would have to find a way of communicating with him and it'd be the bits of Hindi that he picked up in Aden, in, 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 in Tanzania, in the Somaliland. And that's how you get by. And these are men who are incredibly adaptable. I think that's what I wanted to get across that, you know, the, the state is looking down on them. Mm. But when you look at them and look within their world, they're incredibly skilled. They're incredibly adaptable, clever men. That's one of the things that the prison doctor notices about Mahmoud is he's, he's very intelligent. Um, and they're trying to test his IQ and test his sanity for the trial. But um, they're also having, they're also treating him as if he cannot be equal to them. So he, he has to balance that between, you know, making them feel inadequate or threatened, but also for him to have his own self-respect and show that he can do all of these things. So I, yeah, I really wanted to pay close attention to dialect and the way that it can cause confusion, the way that um, Mahmoud's trying to follow the, the, the trial and he was even a court interpreter himself for other people. But in this trial where his own life is at stake, all of the nuance of that kind of English that they're speaking in court is lost on him. You know, they're speaking in, in scientific language, in very legalistic language, in this very elaborate, unnecessarily opaque English. That, that is used even now, I think, to, 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 to veil the real meaning of things. So I think from my experiences in the UK that um, class and the way that language, that the shared language is used amongst this class ridden society is, it can be really dangerous. It can really put people in vulnerable situations when the, the, that register of language suddenly shifts and they go from understanding the situation they're in to not understanding the situation they're in, whether that's in court or in a hospital or in school. So, as you said, I think legalese is often used to obscure, right? To hide meaning or to conceal meaning. And again, I think there's this really good line by Mahmoud when he tells his own lawyer that I can say fuck you in Hindi and I love you in Swahili. So don't, you know, just speak in plain English, right? Uh, instead of using these complicated words. Um, and I think that comes out really yeah. well. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad for that. And I, yeah, I think, you know, why are we speaking like this? Let's just speak in plain English. Um, yeah. And even in literature, I think, when I compare American writing to writing that comes from the UK, American writing is just much clearer, right. <laughs> for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. um, and in Britain, there's all of this dancing around right. the meaning of words. <laughs> Very true. Um, again, sort of uh, as a reader in India, I think there was particular things that kind of jumped out. Um, so of course there was Billa Khan and the character who doesn't, who refuses to speak English. And I think that's why. Um, and there's also a mention of the Bombay Jama Masjid, uh, which Mohammed visited, I think in 1949 or something. Uh, so could we talk a little bit about the relationship again in your research that you found between maybe the Indian sailors and uh, I mean, just this whole migrant community that was in Wales at that time? Yes, uh, and also before that, so there were connections between Somaliland and India um, because of the empire. So Somaliland was actually run from the India office um, and they used rupees and annas and um, there were lots of Indian civil servants in the colony, in the protectorate, as well as the connections that would happen between Somalis and Indians in Aden, where many of them had both settled as immigrant communities. So often that connection would precede their arrival in the UK. But then in the UK, um, in, in mosques, there would be an, a cultural kind of connection between Muslim Indians and Somalis and Malays and all sorts of different people from Muslim backgrounds, Yemenis in particular. I don't think there was any particular friction between Indians or people from the Indian subcontinent and Somalis, but there was, there was one case I found out about where a Somali man was killed, I think through manslaughter by a, a group of Bengali men in a boarding house. Um, and this was 
maybe just the year before Mahmoud had uh, got in, uh, got arrested, um, and the Somali man was drunk, and they had thrown him out of the boarding house and broken his back or broken his neck, and he had died in, in the police station through lack of care. Yeah. So I think all of the communities did have these flashpoints, mm. um, particularly within the black community between Caribbean and African sailors, Somalis and uh, Caribbean sailors uh, more specifically. And I was surprised at just how many black men betrayed Mahmoud mm. during his trial. They, there was you know, the, the informer who was the chief police uh, prosecution witness, and then also just his uh, landlord and right. fellow lodger. And they, for, just for the hell of it, I think, wanted to get him in trouble. So the stress that all of these men were under and the differences in language and culture and religion could create a very combustible combination, which meant that this immigrant community that often did stick together and had gathered together because of the 1919 race riots where they had all you know, barricaded themselves in their boarding houses and fought against these white rioters who'd come to invade Tiger Bay. They could come together, but then I think they could also really tear each other apart and make life difficult for each other. Right. Um, sorry, the other Indian character that just came to mind uh, was, I think I've forgotten his name, uh, Ajit Singh, who was in jail, who, who was hung just before, who was hanged just before Mahmood was. Um, so that's a, yes. that's a true story or that's a... Yeah, and I didn't change his name because I wanted right. people to know more about that case. In 1952, two Asian men, one called Tahir Ali and, and Ajit Singh, and then three men from Africa were executed, or three black men, one was from the Caribbean. So five out of 24 or 25 in 1952, when there were very, very few non-white people in the UK is a shocking number. They made up 20% uh, of executions. Wow. And both Tahir Ali and Ajit Singh, it was um, to do, they, they killed their girlfriends, ex-girlfriends. Mm. So I think the evidence against them is pretty strong. I don't think they were miscarriages of justice, but it also speaks to the, the, the tension that were, was aroused by romantic relationships in this already very fraught racial context where I think Mahmoud, part of the reason that the police hated him was because he'd married a local girl and was legally separated from her. Um, and Ajit Singh was so angry that his ex-girlfriend broke up with him because her family were not happy with him being her boyfriend. He shot her in public. Um, outside a hospital, and he was hanged while Mahmoud was in the same prison. Mm. And, you know, the fact that he had come from India, you know, all the, I think I couldn't help but think about the fate that had drawn these men from across the world to this small town prison in the UK, and all of the different, con you know, convoluted routes they had, that fate had taken them on. Uh, when I was reading the book, uh, like it, there's a line about, and of course, I guess it's true, about how his wife, uh, Laura, fights for 50 years to get him justice. Um, and she finally does. Um, you know, the, the court actually admits that what they did to him was wrong and his body is uh, removed from prison grounds and returned to the family. Um, did you ever think or are you thinking of writing a book about her? Because she seems quite a fascinating character. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> um, but I'm working on an opera. Oh, wow. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so she'll be a big character in that. Um, and I think that I would like to do something with the latter part of the story where the family fight for justice and, and win it right. in this very important historical um, first um, case. His case, Mahmoud's case, is the first ever one, a historic miscarriage of justice overturned by the British courts. Mm. And that's a big deal. You yeah. know, I think the fact that Laura and her family, despite all of the disadvantages that they had, you know, they couldn't have been poorer, they couldn't have been more marginalized, but they were the ones to get this done for the first time. I, fi I find that really inspiring, yeah. really it gives me, you know, tingles. <laughs> so I would like to, to mark that somehow uh, in more detail than I did in The Fortune Men. Right, um, which kind of brings me back to, um, how, how did you decide the title Fortune Men? <laughs> 
I had many titles and to go back to <laughs> Mumbai, one of the titles I had was named after the mosque there, oh, okay. which is put in, in Hindi. Uh, I remember, I used to remember the Hindi or the Urdu, um, but in English, it's the ship of the world to come. Right. Um, so. That's mentioned in the I, book as well, that particular mosque. It is. Right. Okay. Yes, yeah. Um, someone clever will probably find the title very quickly, uh, the real name in, in Urdu. But it became, it was, it had so many titles. And then me and my editor, Mary, just brainstormed and I wrote a long list. And this came to me because it's a term from my first novel. And it's a term that my father taught me, um, which was used about men like him and men like Mahmoud who'd gone to sea. And they were called the fortune men because they were now likely to be able to come back with what seemed a fortune. Mm. Um, for that region at that time, you know, you could earn much more than you could ever earn in Africa on, on those ships. But also I think the double meaning of these men who had put their lives in the hands of fortune, who often did not return, who were lost at sea, who never came back from these small parts of the world which they settled in and married in. Um, so yeah, I think it, it gave it put Mahmoud in a context which I think he belonged in. And it was these men of a particular type who threw themselves into the world like that, come what may, whatever, wherever their fate took them. Uh, so yeah, as a sort of just geeky thing, I was looking for the word fortune in the book. Um, and it doesn't occur too many times, but there's this, again, a really good line, I think towards the end where Mahmoud is thinking about fortune. Um, and he says, um, she's the bitch who took her time and let a man down too hard. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes, and like, he's a gambler. He's, um, he's always thinking about, you know, when, it will, when luck will turn for him, you know, when will he win that big win? And these men, gamblers, people who become addicted to gambling, do have a very strange relationship to, to luck. Mm -hmm. And I think I have a strange relationship to I do believe in luck. Mm -hmm. And I do believe it's something that can appear and also stay with you and then also just disappear. And there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to ride it out. Right. Um, I want to sort of move a little bit from my mood. Um, also because we're kind of running out of time now, uh, to the story of the sisters. Um, so how, what was it like to, to write about, again, Diana is a fascinating character. She's uh, herself, she was in the army, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. her, her husband was, and he dies, uh, he is lost in war and they have a young daughter. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about creating their, that relationship and that story um, of the Violet who was murdered? Yes, so... Um, I, I went from knowing very little, you know, the family don't appear in much of the news reports in any deep way. But when I started researching in earnest, I learned more about them in the, in the newspapers from 1952. And there, again, there seemed to be small traces I kept stumbling across in the RAF Museum in London, where um, there was a whole archive that the family had donated oh, wow. because um, Diana, to use her fictional name, and her husband had volunteered for the RAF before the Second World War had broken out. They were Jewish and could see what Hitler was doing to Jewish families, the community in Germany, and wanted to, 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 to help and to resist him before the British had got their mind around declaring war. So I found her really brave. I found her really interesting. The fact that she had decided to not remarry and to just raise her daughter with her sister, um, and the guts—you know—the there were many in there were many ways in which I could identify with them. They were second-generation immigrants to the UK. The daughter um, Grace was doing her school exams at the exact same time that I was doing them. You know, forty years later, fifty years later. Um, so there were these, these funny moments where I thought in some ways I could identify with them more than I could with Mahmoud. Mm. They were the same age as I was as I was writing this novel. So they just kept calling me and they ended up becoming a much larger part of the novel than I expected. And it was partly, mostly because Diana was such an intriguing character. Right. Um, I think there's also an interesting part about how um, Violet is a quiet person, right? She's quiet, she's diligent, uh, she does her work. And then when she's murdered, there's this thing about how do we eulogize her? Like the, the community mm -hmm. is wondering about that. Um, so yes, how do we 
eulogia is the introvert <laughs> i mean there's no answer to it but <laughs> i know and i think i even i struggle to because um when someone wants their life to be so quiet and she never got married she never really left the shop from the records mm -hmm. that i could find you know she was someone who dedicated herself to to this business um, and her family and that means that even now she's kind of lost in the story you know and i i've always been wary of crime stories where there's a female murder victim and she's just a dead body and it's the it's the murderer who's the center of the story or the police are the center of the story but the victim is just an absence and i didn't want that and i think that's why diana also stepped in and took that um voice because i found out very little about um violet um and when someone wants to be private they have to you have to give them that space to be private rather than really forcing a character too much on them um so violet and diana as you mentioned are also an immigrant family they're a jewish immigrant family uh, but in the hierarchy there are clearly good immigrants and bad immigrants mm -hmm. um and in yeah. fact i think uh, there's a journalist who comes to interview diana after the murder and he talks about uh, there must be so many foreigners right those seamen from bongo bongo land and god knows where uh, violent violent men who are not used to our laws and the way things are done here um so mm. yeah can we talk a bit about that hierarchy between the two sure. the various kinds of migrants sure so yeah i think you know britain had developed a lot of these racial theories before germany had <laughs> they were the ones with the ethnologists going across the world and you know these are martial races these are business like races these are savages these are semi civil semi civilized savages you know they really believed all of this and it It, it infected Britain in, at every level, at university level, um, medical, scientific level, uh, judicial level. So you're dealing with these very toxic, you know, social Darwinistic ways of looking at the world and looking at other people. And then Jewish people in the UK were in a complicated position where there was a lot of anti-Semitism, and what was going on in Palestine and Israel contributed to that. So there were. I didn't know as a as someone who'd grown up in the UK no one ever taught us about these um attacks that happened on Jewish communities in 1947 mm. um and they were attacking shops and looting and doing all the sorts of things because of what had happened to British soldiers in Palestine at the time so the the they have to they have to um navigate this complicated situation where as they go up in class they're seen as more decent and they can also pass that's also important people could change their name um and according to uh, change their religion if they wanted to they could disappear into a bigger community but somalis yemenis pakistanis couldn't you know there were many other barriers towards that so and legally um at this time they they were sort of the possession of the shipping companies the shipping companies were responsible for them and they all had to live in boarding houses owned by the shipping companies as a whole um and they were also a threat because if they ever went on strike then that caused caused real issues for the british so they were corralled and controlled they were they were a much more um threatening group of workers while other people who had small shops or you know businesses here and there didn't have the same economic threat around them Um I just want to talk a little bit about um I mean of course the book is about racism and especially at the level of courts and the police but also you have good cops uh, and I think this book also I mean <laughs> do I <laughs> I mean towards the end he has those two guys in jail who he's you know oh the prison warders yeah the prison yes. warders who are kind of mm -hmm. I mean I won't say friends but they're not enemies let's say <laughs> but I find them even more sinister because the police are they're just hostile you know they're trying to pin him for a murder and they're slowly going about that and they don't give a damn about him while i think being able to sit with someone talk play find out about their family and their history and their fear you know see them being afraid and to still be willing to be part of the machinery of their death that really scares me because i think that that's that's more twisted somehow 
and they, they they feel as if you know there's nothing they can do about it the great british justice system will operate you know its wheels will turn whatever they do or say but there's an intimacy to it um and you know despite all of their chumminess when he's in the execution suite they were probably still racist they were probably mm-hmm. still thinking that he's a darkie you know his life is not worth as much as someone who looks like them or looks like their son you know those attitudes are still very current right now never mind in the 1950s so there's a real and i think these are the kind of guys who would not identify themselves as being cruel or evil or particularly prejudice prejudiced they would see themselves as good guys but they were still part of the machinery that took this man's life wrongly um i think we're nearly out of time but i just have one last question again probably for our indian audiences uh you mentioned before about how you know you watched many hindi movies uh you mm-hmm. kind of followed the mahabharat i think the the television version of it um so yeah so could you just tell us a little bit about that <laughs> sure um when i was living in somali land uh what's what was somali at the time as a child my mom had a, a video hall and she would um put videos on the the, the local the neighborhood and a lot of them were indian so we were really familiar with amitabh bachan um growing up and you know that was also a way when i came to britain there was no representation of somalis and not much of africans at all so indian pe- people became the most familiar i was lucky enough to live in tooting when i was very small and that's a big indian pakistani community there so you have familiar shops familiar smells familiar mm-hmm. um ways of living and i think that helped that transition and then we moved to another part of london which was not like that it was very uniformly white and we felt very foreign very um almost threatened you know there was that feeling of being isolated so and i you know grew up in indian literature rohinton mystery arundhati roy this has been a big part of the influences i think on me um and i'm particularly interested in how that east african indian ocean world interconnects because that goes much uh, that goes back much further than the british empire you know these connections have been made there are hindi words in somali there are somalis in india when i was in amdabad and i went to the mosque that was established by an ethiopian man in the 1500s there are these really fascinating connections right um wonderful uh, just finally what is your opera about <laughs> if you could it's just about the fortune men it's about fortune that's right <laughs> yeah so we've already done i'm working with a composer called Nina Whiteman okay. who i actually went to university with and then oh, nice. reunited 20 years later um and she's a fantastic composer working in experimental electronic music um and we presented it last summer at the Royal Opera House and we're still working with the Royal Opera House now Wonderful. Thank you so much Nadeepa. That was excellent. Thank you Nandini. Uh, Thank that you. was Thanks so much JLF. Thank you Nadeepa Mohammad and Nandini Nair for that delightful conversation. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. Please do stay logged on and continue to watch the series of amazing sessions and Jaipur writer shorts that have been specially curated for you.